The Psychedelic Integration Coach and Psychedelia Psychedelic Experience Integration are a collective of professionals and peers interested in the potential psychological and spiritual healing properties of psychedelics. Our events are intended for the purpose of educating about mindful and safe integration of entheogenic experiences, offering emotional support, and creating meaningful connections between community members. Find more information at www.psychedelicintegrationcoach.com slash events, and may you live that psychedelic feeling. Thank you, Sheree, for inviting me to do this, okay. and uh, thank you all to for being here. Some old friends, some new faces. This is wonderful. I love this is this is probably my favorite thing is just talking about this. Um, I love doing it, but I like talking about it too a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so first I'll just I'll just start off and kind of tell my story to give you a, a little bit of a background. I, I know it was glossed over in the introduction, so I'll give it a little bit more of an understanding. So I, I was raised in North Carolina in a small town in the mountains and my family was Mormon and we were the only Mormons in my town and so I was the only Mormon in my tiny little school K through 12 and so it was, it was who I was. I was the Mormon kid. They called me the Stormin' Mormon in, uh, in, when I played sports and I didn't play sports on Sundays. I didn't drink caffeine. I had all these rules that no one really understood, uh, but I, I followed them because I felt like this was, this was something that I needed to do. So I did it. And I continued, I, I was very adamant about not using any substances. I didn't smoke marijuana with my friends. I didn't, I didn't even know the kids were using psychedelics in high school right next to me. Um, it just wasn't even in my awareness. I had no clue and I didn't care. And so then I went and I did a Mormon mission. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but I went and spent two years of my life knocking doors and sitting in people's homes and talking to them about transformation by reading the Book of Mormon. And I wasn't very successful at that. <laughs> there was just something about it that didn't click for me. Uh, you know, I, had, I hadn't had the experience even though I, I somewhat believed. But I, I learned a lot. And I went to Washington State. I knocked on a lot of doors and I talked to a lot of people. And I wasn't the most outgoing person when I, growing up. I was actually somewhat of a, a loner. I liked to just spend time by myself and do, do my own thing. And so on my mission, I, I enjoyed reading, I enjoyed studying, and I just did my work. And then I got off and I was 21 years old. I, I went home and I got a job selling door to door. And I thought, okay, here I go. I got to find a wife and get married within a year. <laughs> and that's what they tell you to do. So I was on a, my next mission, which was to find a wife and get married and start having children. And I thought I'd have four children by the time I was 28. And I was, I was sad. That was my path. So I started to work, I started to travel across the country, and I started to realize that something about this, this lifestyle, this religion, it wasn't really clicking. It didn't, it didn't fill all my checkboxes of fulfillment. I was just kind of like going through the motions. And so I thought, well, I got to do something here. So I decided I'll move to Utah, see what that's like. I don't know if any of you have been to Utah, but... <laughs> That is, that is a weird, weird place to be. <laughs> so I spent a few months in Utah, and then I said, okay, i got to go somewhere else. So I went to Arizona, and that's kind of where I decided, okay, I'm going to set up shop here. There's not as many Mormons, and it is deathly hot, but maybe this will be a little bit more normal for me. Because I wasn't really n used to the Mormon culture in, like, fullness. I kind of was just... Again, going through the motions. And so I was, in, I was in Arizona. I started going to school again, and I had this ambition to be a doctor. So I'm studying chemistry. I'm studying physics. I'm going to school. 
doing really well, everything's great, I have a good job, everything's great. And then it's probably about a year and a half in, I started reading some very powerful books uh, by Ayn Rand. I read Dune. I started to read these books that really started to change my perception on what it meant to be uh, an individual, a human, myself. And so I'm reading these books, they're inspiring me. I'm realizing that every Sunday when I go to church, it's not inspiring me. <laughs> it's boring me because I've heard the same thing over and over and it's not doing anything for me. And then one day a friend came home with uh, some psilocybin mushrooms. And I just, I said, okay, let's, let's go for this. Let's try this. So I took about a 16th of psilocybin mushrooms and we just started wandering around the town. No plan, no, didn't know what I was doing. Neither of us had any clue what to expect. And I remember I found myself sitting in a bus, you know, the bus stops with the walls and the advertisements and just kind of marveling at this reflection and then wandering over into the grass and looking at a blade of grass and just being in utter amazement at this, this little simple thing. And I realized the, in the moment, I realized I'm just sitting here staring at a blade of grass and I'm just totally enamored by this blade of grass, but it was what it was. So after that experience, I said, there's, there's something here, but I don't have any clue who is doing this or how to get this. So I started going online, Arrowhead and other places, and I started seeing, okay, what other stuff can I eat? And so, <laughs> so I started to order different seeds, uh, Hawaiian baby wood rose seeds, morning glory seeds, started trying those, which have LSA, which is a, a precursor to LSD. Uh, they were rather uncomfortable experiences, but again, a, a, an altered state, and I thought it was great because I had no reference, you know, 12 hours of your stomach hurting with some slight changes in perception. I'll take it. <laughs> That's all I got. I'll take it, whatever. So I'm, I'm kind of like bumbling my way through here. We, I remember we bought a San Pedro cactus from a local flower shop and ground it up in a blender and drank. I probably drank, you know, a foot and a half of cactus. Ch chasing it with cranberry juice because it's so thick. And nothing happened. <laughs> Just a stomach full of cactus. So that was, that was a bust. So and I'm, I'm figuring all this out and I'm like, I decided this was, you know, this was a few months and then I just said to myself, I'm not happy here. I, even though I was doing really well at school, I was at ASU, everything was fine within my life. I had a good job. I said, I'm not happy here. I want to go see if I can be an actor because I thought maybe I, I want to do that. So I picked up and I left and I moved to Los Angeles. And I went and did a couple auditions. I did some extra work and I said, I'm, that's it, I'm done with that. <laughs> that was uh, a little monotonous and not so exciting for me. So decided to get back into school. And LA is really where things opened up for me because in Los Angeles, there was a lot of access to a lot of things. You know, you could, I remember I had a roommate early on and just, just him knowing that I was interested in these things suddenly oh here's cocaine you want to try this sure uh here's mdma you want to try this sure i didn't say no to anything i wasn't because i'd said no for so long in my life that i was not going to say no anymore i didn't care what anyone said i didn't care what people talked about you know this is going to happen i said i've listened to that my whole life and i'm not going to do it anymore so i'm trying all this stuff I'm ordering spores off the internet. I started growing psilocybin mushrooms. That was awesome. That was really beautiful to see the process, see them growing. It felt like I don't have children, but maybe it's something like having children. <laughs> probably not, probably not at all. But, uh, <laughs> but it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was, I really enjoyed it. And I, and I was, I just went for it. I was trying different things with different things, mixing and matching, doing whatever I could because I 
just was really curious. And I, I was not fearful in any way. I was going to go for it. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of crazy experiences in there that I won't get into. But eventually one day I was at, uh, I decided to start over in my college career when I got here. And so I went to West Los Angeles College to start over and started taking classes. And I was taking an anthropology class and there was a young man there. I was a little bit older than all the students. I was about 20, 23 at the time. And we're in class and obviously I was the one talking and I was older and just had a little bit more life experience than a lot of the younger students. And he knew I was interested in, in psychedelics and he asked me if I've ever tried opiates. And I said, no, but I want to. And he said, uh, <laughs> he said, oh yeah, well come on, you know, you should come over sometime. I said, oh sure. So I think I went over to his house maybe a week or two later and he gave me some oxycodone, Percocet, or they hydrocodone. I don't remember anymore. I think they're hydrocodone, but he gave me some, um, some just two pills. I think they're 10 milligrams each and I took them and I had this, this warm, fuzzy feeling. And I thought, oh, this is, this is really nice. I, I like this. And so, you know, well, sure, whatever. Next day, no big deal. Went back to school. It was fine. Then I went over to his house again a few days later, and he gave me a couple more. I ended up puking. It was a little bit more than I could take. But again, it was a nice, it, it was probably the first time where I really was able to quiet things for myself, to really like shut down in a way. Because I wasn't, I wasn't an alcohol drinker. I really didn't. I kind of abhorred alcohol. It was not something I enjoyed at all. So this was just a way for me to really shut down and be at peace. So, you know, next day, no big deal. And I thought, oh, you know, people talk about this, these opiates, like it's such a dangerous thing. Yeah, right, whatever. So he said, well, if you like this, you should try heroin. I said, ah, okay. So then... Uh, I think it was a few weeks later my roommate said hey there's this guy who's selling he's selling uh, pot in our apartment complex and I said hmm so I ran down I went over to him and I said hey you know I heard you're selling pot do you know where to get heroin and, <laughs> and he said yes he said let me make a call uh, it just I mean that's that's not a very normal thing but it was just because where I was I was you know and who he was he was, a, he was someone who'd struggled with addiction. And so he made a call. Some people showed up in a car, and we, I picked up my first, my first bag, my first balloon. And then I started smoking heroin uh, off tinfoil. And again, it was a really warm experience for me because it, was, it, made, it honestly made me more social it made me able to get outside of myself because I was still a very shy person. I still had a lot of inhibition. Uh, I hadn't really dated many women. I hadn't had very many experiences in life still that I felt comfortable to be myself. I was just figuring that out. You know, I felt like I was a teenager almost. And so I would smoke every few days, maybe once a week. And it was, it was actually, I enjoyed it. So then it started to become more and more and it would be that I would go to bars where people were drinking and they would ask me, hey, why aren't you drinking? And I'd say, oh, no, I just smoke some heroin. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I, I like that better. You know, I got some weird looks and, yeah, I didn't. I, it's not that I was totally naive that I would get weird looks. I just didn't care. I, I felt like the, the way people were viewing this was ridiculous. So... What happened is, is I ended up getting in a, a relationship. And as I started to do more, and I was still experimenting a lot with psychedelics, but I, wouldn't, I would never do psychedelics with the heroin. There was this weird dynamic that I never wanted to do that. Uh, it was one or the other. And I was doing a lot of exploring. And uh, this relationship, there was a lot of substance of abuse. There was a lot of... Um, cocaine and MDMA and, and then I would smoke heroin and what eventually started happening is is that whenever we would get in fights I'd go home and I'd just smoke heroin and that would take everything away that would numb it all out 
So this started happening more and more, and I started smoking more and more, and I thought, oh, I'll never, uh, addict, I never, I'll never be an addict. Not me, I, I was too strong, I was too, I can say no. I mean, I could say no before, but I figured I always have this inner reserve to be able to control my life. And so what started happening is over and over, I'm doing it more and more. And I remember the first time I had withdrawals was when I was at work one day and my stomach just started seizing up and I didn't know what was going on. I think I'd stopped using the day before and I had to lay on the floor and I was just in so much pain because my, I thought I had stomachs like a flu or something that just came on. So anyways, I went home that day and I took some, some pills and I was fine. I said, oh yeah, there's a secret to all my, all my woes. If I'm emotionally hurt, I can smoke heroin. If I feel bad physically, I can take some pills or smoke. I'm good. I, don't, I used to tell my father, I'd say, oh, this is the best antidepressant there is. And my parents were really, really uh, wise about this whole situation. They still lived in North Carolina. They, they weren't really practicing the Mormon faith anymore, but they just, they would just listen They'd express that they were a little concerned and for me to be careful, but they never told me what to do. They never said, you're doing something wrong, or they never got upset. They just, my dad would actually say, you know, how's your experiment going sometimes? And they, oh, you know, it's, it's going. Obviously it got worse, but it's going. <laughs> so this all was happening and then I started, I was really in it after a while. And at the same time, I, I was doing well at school at the beginning. I got into UCLA. I had a scholarship. I was ready, you know, starting at UCLA, had a good job, everything was good. But it started that I was smoking more and more every day. And I started to, I was starting to smoke $100 a day, or $150 a day, which is not easy to do. It was really tough to keep up. And I, and I was pretty industrious, so I was, selling. I'd buy more than I would use. I'd sell stuff here and there, whatever I could. And then eventually I said, just economically, I said, I need to start. I didn't ever want to use a needle. I never thought I would use a needle. I never thought I would inject anything. But I remember a friend brought some things over from a nurse that he'd gotten. And so I tried some uh, what's called oxymorphone. And, uh, you know, I thought, oh, what's from the, the hospital? This is okay. You know, this is what doctors are using. I, I, I didn't hit the first time. What that means is I didn't hit my vein. So it was, that was a was kind of a learning lesson, which is kind of, it's painful. But uh, that, was, that was the breaking point, I think. That was really where it, it started to go downhill. So just out of necessity, eventually I asked my friend to, to use a needle on me to shoot me up. And then it spiraled. And then it was like, you know, I'll jump forward, but I spent about a year and a half using needles. I also injected cocaine. That was about the time I, I used meth. I had a couple binges with meth. I ended up losing my, my car, crashed a, crashed a car, losing my job. Sorry, I lost my job, crashed my car. Uh, and then it was getting so bad that I, I found myself sometimes in UCLA bathrooms between class or even in the middle of class shooting up heroin and thinking to myself, what is going on? Driving my motorcycle through the freeway, driving around, and having moments of wanting to kill myself, and then using again and being fine, you know, this roller coaster. And I thought to myself, like, to help people understand, because people always ask me, what is it like? And, you know, the experience, I don't think I can really give a, a good, accurate representation. It's kind of like explaining a psychedelic to someone. It's hard to explain a personal experience, but this is what my life looked like. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd wake up, I'd look over. I always made sure I had something generally, and I'd say, okay, good, you know, prepare my, prepare my shot, and I'd, I'd do, do what I needed to do. And I'd get this just overwhelming sense of everything's okay. You know, you wake up kind of in a panic mode a little bit. Everything's okay. Then I'd eat my breakfast. I'd just get ready for my day. You know, sit around quite a bit, maybe go to school. But then, you know, every few hours, every four hours, I'd use again. It was, it was like a regiment. And I just kept doing it. You know, and some days I'd have to go wait for four or five hours for someone to come by. 
or I'd have to drive somewhere to go make some money or I'd have to figure out some way to get stuff. But generally, it was just this medicine for me to dull the pain and where I was and how my life was going down. So all this time, I'm trying different psychedelics. I remember I tried MDMA. I was extracting DMT, and I remember smoking DMT for a week, multiple times a day to get some relief. Um, LSD. I go home. I drink sometimes a lot. I the methamphetamine or the cocaine. I I try all these different things to try to break the cycle, because I just thought if I can just get enough days, I'll be okay. If I can just get enough days, I'll be okay. And then eventually, I um, I think the last stint of that was I I took a trip. I went and rode freight trains for a month, and I was detoxing off something called Suboxone, which is a a maintenance drug that people with addiction will take. They take once a day and it keeps them well, but it doesn't get them high. So I was detoxing off that and I was riding freight trains through the Pacific Northwest and hitchhiking and detoxing and hiking. And it was actually a really great way to detox. It was kind of like survival detox because I didn't have a choice. I had to, didn't matter how bad I felt, I had to wake up and go. So eventually, I, uh, I remember I ran into a kid in, in Portland. I was at a park and we were talking to him and he, he, I had told him what I was dealing with and he said, oh yeah, I, I used to have a heroin addiction and I did this thing called Ibogaine a few years ago. And I thought, Ibogaine, okay. I think I'd seen it on Arrowit or something, but it never really, I, I didn't believe and I didn't think I, I always thought I could figure it out. I always thought I could do this on my own. I could figure it out. I could do it at home. I could just, I could, I could beat it. That was my, my thought the whole time. Because I'm not an addict. I, I, don't, I didn't even think I had an addiction. I just had a bad habit. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sure any, anyone would disagree with that one. But uh, I, I didn't believe it. And then... It was about five months later, I was, I was stealing to make money and from, from like stores, Walmart, stuff like that. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I, I, hit, I hit a point where I was flunking out of school. I had no more money, my car was busted. And I started calling some Ibogaine clinics, probably the beginning of December, 2012. I called a few clinics didn't did not have five thousand dollars to go do treatment i was not about to tell my parents that i was going to go do treatment or that i was going to you know try to hustle money from my family i was not about to ask for help that was not that was not a route i was willing to go so that month progresses I decided to go to Las Vegas for 2012, and as I was doing what I normally was doing, stealing, I got arrested in Las Vegas, and I spent New Year's in a jail cell um, of 2012, lying there under, I remember watching the ball drop from one of the little TVs in the detox cell, just wondering if I was going to be in jail for the next three days, because it was a weekend and a holiday. and. If you've ever experienced any type of withdrawal symptoms, that's like the worst feeling, is you're trapped and you got nowhere to go and you're gonna have to be stuck. Fortunately, they let me out because I was a UCLA student and I went home and I made a call to the first, the first IBM clinic that picked up. When I got home, there was a check in the mail from UCLA, which was $5,000 and it was for my upcoming semester, which I had to pay back anyway because I'd flunked out. But I, you know, it was, it was an advance, and so I said, "Well, I can either keep going at this and try to figure this out, or I can use this money to go to Mexico." And I figured, you know, I, I might as well just try Mexico because if it doesn't work, I'm just going to kill myself anyway. Because this, I'm not. I'm, I was over it. I was pretty over it. That the jail experience was pretty much the turning point for me. Of like, this is this is it. So I went to Mexico, and I remember driving across the border and just weeping as I got in the car. Just kind of 
at my at my lowest point, not knowing what was going to happen. Not I didn't I don't even know if I had hope at that point because I tried everything. I just was like this is my last option. So Hi Barry. <laughs> so I ended up uh, in the treatment center and I waited a couple of days and then they gave me the Ibogaine. And I remember sitting there a few hours in going to myself, oh crap, this isn't working. I'm not having any experience here. I mean, I was, I was, it was in physically I was feeling it. My withdrawals had minimized, but I was not having any psychedelic experience. You know, there was maybe if I closed my eyes and tried really hard, there was maybe some swirling or something, but nothing. And I just thought, oh, I just wasted all my money. And here I am. This isn't going to work. So I just tried to sit there and deal with it. And I don't know if you've ever done Ibogaine or heard about it, but it lasts a long time. So I was in for, was in for a little bit. So about halfway through, I ended up purging. And I remember it really specifically. It was this dark red vision that was coming through. And it was like chainsaws were moving through my my sphere moving through me and this anger and this pain was coming out i didn't know why it was just it, that's what it was and then when i came up from that and i kind of recovered i just started to weep and i don't know why and then i started to realize that what the truth was is that i hated myself i just i hated myself and I think that was what I was living with. I'd hated myself since I was a little kid, probably. And this was finally, I was finally recognizing this. It had been dulled down by religion. It had been dulled down by, you know, recreational use or unsupervised use of, of psychedelic substances. It had been dulled down by all the addictive substances. And just in that moment, it was, I really hate myself. And from from releasing all that, I don't know how long that lasted, but at some point it ended and that was that was it for my experience and then i came to the next day and i was beat up i could barely walk i didn't want to eat anything couldn't sleep really irritable and that lasted for two days and i was just you know i i don't even know if i was thinking anything it was just i was in a state of zombiness after after this slog of life that I'd been through. And then I finally got some sleep that night and I woke up the next morning, I think probably at 5.30 or 6. And I went downstairs and I made eggs and I was me. And I don't, I don't you know, it, it was the most, it, the, easily the most miraculous experience I've ever had. And it's not as if I, you know, it's not as if it was this big, crazy thing that I saw or understood. It was the simplest realization, I think, for me to let go of that self-hatred. And then I was me again. And so I went, I left about a day or two later. I went back to L.A. I went back to school. I, I only missed a week of school. I got back in school. I started to work out immediately. I started going to the gym. I loved going to the gym, so that was something that I really enjoyed. And I just put my life back together. So, long story, then I started to work and help people to do Ibogaine. I, a friend came to me, a friend I met at the Ibogaine clinic. He said, hey, why don't we do this? And I said, you know, and it's funny because I, I told them how interested I was in psychedelics. And a couple of years prior, I actually had gone to MAPS in Santa Cruz and gone and knocked on the door of this little cabin. No one was home. I thought I was going to work for MAPS when I was still struggling with a heroin addiction. But good thing they didn't answer at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I, you know, my friend told me, hey, we should do this. We should help people do this. And so I thought, hmm. 
I, I don't know if I really put it together then, but I thought, hey, I'm, I'm good at, at talking to people and talking to strangers and knocking on doors or, you know, talking to I have a lot of training. I'll just, I'll give this a try. And so we started helping people go to Mexico and I started to develop a few clinics in Mexico. And I spent about mm, two, two years, two and a half years developing clinics in Mexico. And at the beginning, I kind of did it all. I was cooking, cleaning, sitting by people through their Ibogaine experience. There was the nurse there as well. But I really I invested myself fully in the experience with people. You know, um, yeah, that, and that's really tough because they'll, they'll be so hopeful and then they'll have this experience and not a lot may happen. And then they say, you lied to me. You're a liar and you stole my money and stuff. And then a couple of days later, they say, you're a miracle worker. You saved my life. It was like, it was like this constant, you know, like flip switch. Uh, was, but I did that for a couple of years. And a lot of my work was actually taking phone calls and introducing people to the idea and helping them make the decision and their families make the decision to do this versus some conventional treatment or, or something else. And I, I believed in it. And I still believe in it wholeheartedly. It's, you know, as I said, the, the most profound miracle of my life thus far. So I did that and then I took a little bit of a break, but then I started to do the, the recovery um, aftercare as well. So I, I started a, um, a sober living in San Diego that would actually take people who had done Ibogaine and they would come to us and they'd stay at my house and basically, I'd spend a lot of time with them again, and we'd take them to Kundalini Yoga. We'd do Kambo with them. We'd do um, cryotherapy and saunas and float tanks and you name it. I mean, I, I was really plugging the depths of what what can help someone wake up. Because a lot of people, even after they've done Ibogaine, they still have a lot of challenges. They still don't know what to do with their lives. They still are left with this vacuum. And I, I'm actually really fortunate because I knew how to be a successful adult before my addiction. So it was, for me, it was just putting the, the pieces back together. It wasn't like I had to learn a whole new program. But a lot of these younger people, they get into addiction when they're 15, 16, and then they don't even know what it is to be an adult. They have no clue what it's even like to cook dinner for themselves, to wake up on time, and they just don't get it. So I really did everything I could to try to instill this into people. And we had very, I mean, in comparison, really good success. I would say about half of the people that came through our treatment program were able to stay sober and long term, and it's been a couple of years now. And so uh, I've kept in touch with a lot of people that have, have been through the programs that I've worked with. And I've seen a lot of amazing stories, but I've also seen a lot of, a lot of people that still struggle and they're still in their addiction. And so that kind of brings me to my discussion today. And I, I stopped working in addiction a few years ago to choose to take a break from that because it is rather intensive emotionally. It takes a lot. You know, some of you here do work in addiction and you know how difficult it can be. And so I took a break and I started to work with some other things, uh, ayahuasca in particular, and helping people experience that medicine, going to Peru and Brazil, as well as the bufo, the toad, helping people do that, going to Mexico. And now my, my life is taking another turn and I'm going to be getting back into addiction. So I, that's why I chose this topic and not some other topic. Um, Cherie asked me, I just recently co-authored a book about ayahuasca and integrating ayahuasca and preparing for ayahuasca and sort of just a guide with Dario here, and which we have copies here. <laughs> Um, but I decided to talk about addiction and integration because I feel that that is the most pertinent subject that we can talk about. And, and, I, and I feel empowered in that because 
one, Michael Pollan said so, and what Michael Pollan says is <laughs> it's true. But also, I, I really see the expanded view as as Sheree was sharing with you in the the introduction. I wrote that, and there's a lot of Buddhist elements in there as I as I reference suffering and desire. But I do believe that addiction is just simply a continuum of us as humans desiring something and that it is just a much just as much of an addiction to negative thought patterns as it is to heroin now one has what much more debilitating consequences and has much more of a an impact on the world around us but they're equally the same because they equally take us away from being present and living our lives in fulfillment one may kill someone sooner or later, the other just takes longer, right? It's kind of like the obesity it takes a long time to kill people, but I mean, it still kills people, even though they're not aware of it. Um, and so I believe that it is, it is truly desire and suffering that are the fundamental addictions. And in my experience, that's what I was going through. I, I was desiring something. I was hoping for something. Even when I was in my religion, I was, I had my eye set on the prize. I was going to achieve and get to this higher kingdom. You know, Mormons believe in these tiers of heaven and you get, you're the best if you get to the highest one. It's kind of ridiculous, but I believe that I was going to be the best and get this, you know, this pat on the back from God. That was what I was going for. And then when I started to realize that maybe that wasn't actually real and maybe that was actually keeping me from being happy in the moment there was something wrong there and so I think it's important that we recognize that we all suffer from various states of addiction now I don't believe any of us are addicts I don't believe anyone is an addict I think that that is a, a derogatory term and should never be applied to anyone I think there are people that suffer from serious addictions and there are people that suffer from less serious addictions or just conditioning. They suffer from con conditioning and patterning and behavior that brings them pain and suffering. But I think it's important that we start to reevaluate the way we speak about this because it's my belief that addiction is actually a transformational process, that it's actually a beneficial tool for the individual. Now it's kind of a, you know, a winner take all. I mean, if you don't, if you don't beat it, there's, it really sucks. But if you get on the other side of it, it is such a powerful experience. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I imagine when I first went through my experience, I would, comp I would say, man, I feel like I just beat cancer because it really felt like a death sentence to me. It really, it was just something I could not get over. And so I look at it like that as this really beautiful transformational process that I went through. And I, I am so grateful for what I went through. As, as tough as it was, it brought me to a realization and a humility that I never had before because I was, I was kind of a jerk and I was very judgmental and I thought I had it all figured out and I knew everything and I had to tell everyone else what to do and I was right and I suddenly realized that I don't got anything figured out. <laughs> I had nothing figured out and I, had, I was losing at the game of life. So yeah, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that process and you know there's some things I've learned along the way there's there's many things I've learned in this path of integration and what integration means and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and discuss a little bit about the possibilities of integration and how someone can look and view integration and maybe it's the same as all the what everyone else is saying, but I hope it, it's a little bit different because I don't want to sound like everyone else. Integration is a big topic that a lot of people are discussing right now, 
and it's hugely important. And so I want to see if I can shed some light in a different, a different avenue. So when I think of integration, I literally just think of, okay, what, what is life like? And I, I always ask people after they've had some sort of psychedelic experience or before they have a psychedelic experience, I ask them, what do you want your life to look like? What is the vision that you have for your life? And so many people don't have an answer. You know, or they have some, some vague, amorphous way of explaining, well, I want to I wanna be more loving, or I want to I be more forgiving, or I want to be kinder. And I, and I think to myself, well, okay, I understand that. I understand that. Those are valid responses, and that's what everyone... I think wants in their life but I I'm a practical person I think in practical ways and I do my best if I'm if I'm addressing how I'm living my life or what I'm doing in my life to find practical ways of accomplishing it so when I think of integration I think of what what exactly what specifically do you want your life to look like just like if you're building a house Right? If you just said, I want a house that's really nice and colorful and, and, and airy and open, and you just said, okay, go build that to someone, you're probably not going to get what you want. You're probably going to end up something totally different than what you see in your mind's eye. So I think integration really is about getting precise and getting, getting very serious about, okay, what, what does life look like? after I do this experience. What, what practices am I going to put in place? Okay? And how seriously am I going to take these things? And as I was saying, a lot of people with addiction, one of the biggest challenges they have is developing good habits. You know, they say replace a bad habit with a good habit. They don't even know how to do that. So what do you do? You, know, you sit there with them, help, you know, it's, it's really challenging. It's really tough to get someone to desire to create new habits. I, um, I talked to someone today who's struggling with addiction, and I just said to her, I said, you know, you sh have you ever thought about journaling? Her response was, I'm not a journaling person. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I know. That's why I'm, that, that's the point. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> there's, these, there's these things that we can do if we really get serious that probably all of us can look at our life and think, what can I do, what little thing can I do to start to change what I'm doing in my life? And I've found that the things that have helped me the most are the same things that help most successful people. There's really, I really look at um, just a few major components of my life. Okay, so in my life, the way I integrate and the way I've integrated the last couple of years and what I've decided to do with my life is I really pay attention to the first couple hours in the morning and the, first, and the, the last hours in the evening. And I, that, that's it. Everything else in between can be whatever it needs to be, but I just focus on those, those times. So that way I'm not, I'm not trying to think about this big thing. I'm just focused on these few hours. And sometimes it can only, you know, it starts, maybe it's 30 minutes. Maybe it's one hour. But just starting somewhere where it's like, okay, I'm first thing and last thing, what am I focusing on? And for me, what's been most valuable is I just, I, it's so simple. I just pay attention to a couple things. I pay attention to my my spiritual state i pay attention to my psychological state my emotional state and my physical state so the four four areas that i veer into when i'm working on myself these are the four areas that i pay attention to and for me i found that the simplest practices and i'm not someone that's like like a super go-getter or anything like that I, you know I'm not Elon Musk I'm not trying to conquer the world or or be a billionaire or anything like that I really would 
be super happy if I could just live in the woods and read all day. But uh, I don't know why I left. You know. <laughs> but anyways, I just focus on those four things. And, and the, what I do to address those four things is for my physical state, I do some simple exercising. I used to think I had to do a full yoga class or I had to, you know, exercise for an hour or go for a 30 minute run or something like that. But I'm not at that place in my life. And I realized that because I kept trying to do that and I kept failing. So I just started to say, okay, well, when I wake up, I'm going to stretch for five minutes and I'm going to do some moderate exercise for five or 10 minutes. I'm not even going to I'm not going to veer past that. I'm just going to start to develop this habit. Because I've had times where I was really good at habits, and then I've had times where I'm not so good, and I let things lapse for years. And it's not easy to just pick up a new habit. Has anyone just picked up, anyone here have a hard time picking up new habits? Yeah? Anyone it's super easy for? Anyone got the secret? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Yeah, I think all of us have a challenge with habit forming. So start small. Start really small. And just start consistency. Consistency is the key. So that's, that's like my morning. That's the first thing. And it doesn't have to be the first thing. It may be the third thing of that morning. But then I focus on my psychological state. So I read. I love reading. I probably spend more time reading than anything else. And I don't, I don't always read self-help books. I'm not like a self-help book guru or anything. You know, I, I read a lot of things. I read fiction. I read nonfiction. I read historical. I just lo- I like reading. So that's an easy one for me. That's one of the easier habits for me. So I read, and that takes care of my mind. And then my emotional state, this is one that I just picked up recently, which is journaling. I kept telling people to journal all the time, and I never journaled. <laughs> Have you ever done that? You tell people to do stuff and you don't do it? Yeah, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, me too. So I just started journaling uh, probably about a month ago. And it's, it's so rewarding. And, and whenever I work with people, now that is the number one thing I tell them to do. I don't tell them, I don't say meditate. I don't say exercise. I don't say, I just journal. Just write a little bit doesn't have to be about anything you could just beat a sentence just write anything and just start writing consistently and naturally just like with any exercise it will grow and build and the reason why I call that my emotional that's my emotional area is because that's where I get to really talk to someone I don't have a, I don't have a therapist I don't go to a therapist I do do a lot of psychedelics but uh, journaling is, is that integrative time. It's that grounded time. And I just, it's like when I'm talking to myself. Because I don't, I don't like sharing or putting problems or necessarily sharing my emotions with people. Or I don't have people that I do that so much with. So I do it with myself. And I do it in a very non-judgmental way. I just lay it out there. And it grows, and it's growing, and it's, it's such a beautiful practice. So that's, that, that's where I take care of my emotional state. And then my spiritual state is meditation. I, I do meditation. This isn't something I've done for a long time. It's only been a few months. And I've tried lots of different ways. I've tried different types of pranayama and different types of meditation and mantra. And I, I prefer to do no mind meditation. So I just focus on my breath and letting, letting myself be clear of thoughts. And sometimes it's five minutes, but generally I like to go longer. And I just set aside that time in the morning so it's like I don't have anything else to do. So I can spend as much time or as little time as I need on these four things, but that's what I do, those four things. And then at night, I... Repeat the process. That's it. I, I, don't, I don't think integration has to be a big thing. Your life, you're constantly integrating. Every moment of your life, you're learning. Every time you encounter someone, you're learning, hopefully. And what I view psychedelics as is tools and catalysts 
to help you be more aware. Sometimes they're transformational. Sometimes they have the power to shift things dramatically. But a lot of times they're just simple reminders of being more aware and being more present and giving you the energy and the motivation to take on something new. Just and one just little things. So that's that's integration for me. I don't you know, it's pretty simple. Any questions? Any thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm going to start working with addiction again, and I've had a lot, of, a lot of people have wanted me to get involved with clinics and things like that, but I realized that clinics and working with people really in that, in that highly powerful moment, in that really difficult time, is not where I want to be personally. That's not part of my integration practice at this point in my life. So I actually want to help develop um, a system program to basically teach people what I just told you all and just help people and help people figure out how this can work for them. I mean, when you're talking about addiction and people coming out of serious addiction, there's, there's so many things, right? There's like what you're eating, there's social media, there's how you talk, there's what you read, what's on TV, there's you know, how you sleep, are you looking at your phone at night, are you waking up looking at your phone, I mean, there's like a billion things that you can do to change, and, and a lot of these people that are coming out of like more serious addictions, they don't know any of this stuff, and, and they're really tied to a lot of these really negative behavior patterns, and so I'm going to start working on a way to help them uh, from, from an extended place, not in person typically, but from an extended place on figuring out what works for them, what, the, what path or what, what little crack we can get into their identity to start worming our way in to start shedding some of the layers and help them to figure out what it is they need to do to start. Like maybe it's just getting off Facebook, you know? I mean, I'd be happy if someone is using heroin and they just stop using Facebook because they're using Facebook too much. Like, I, don't, I don't care if you're going to use heroin, great. You're going to use meth, great. Let's, let's focus on something else easier. Let's start with something a little simpler before we have to like bang out this tough one because I know what that's like and it's super hard. So let's just like maybe you wake up in the morning and you drink a glass of water. Maybe that's where we start. Like everyone's starting somewhere. So I think a lot of people, they, they look at the mountain to climb and they are scared to take the first step because it's this huge mountain. And that's not, that's not any way to get anywhere. And so I'm gonna be working with people in that way and helping develop guidance systems to help guide people on a consistent basis, long term, and promoting psychedelics, promoting microdosing, promoting various ways of using psychedelics to help them deal with their addiction and deal with the underlying issues. Because I'm when I was in addiction, I used a lot of psychedelics. I used more psychedelics when I was dealing with my addiction, probably, or or like when I was in the the interim time, than I do now. I mean, it was like two or three times a week. And then I'd have my days where I'd be using addictive substances. So it was like I was constantly on something. And they didn't teach me very much because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no frame of reference, no understanding. I mean, this is like seven, eight years ago. So much has happened in the, just in the last five years around this whole space of understanding intentionality and how to use psychedelics. So I really want to help people to do that, to use psychedelics for their addiction and to get out of this mindset of, I'm an addict. I cannot stand when people tell me they're an addict. <laughs> I'm not a 12-step guy in the sense that I like the culture. I love the 12 steps, but I don't like the culture. Yeah. 
I, I think it's, it's been a wonderful tool for people who didn't know what to do. And it's been a wonderful outlet for a lot of people to get support and connect with other people that are in a similar place in their life. And unfortunately, it does have some things that, you know, maybe are not the healthiest practices. But as a whole, it's a good system and it's worked for a lot of people. But fundamentally, it also is a system that's not even adhering to its roots. You know, you have, you have the, the founders, the people that are venerated as developing this system, who their history is just ignored of using psychedelics. And you have this mentality of addiction that's not talked about in the big book. It's not, it doesn't say anything in there that you have to say you're an addict. I think the only, I mean, just, it says go through the steps and it says, it's, you know, admit that you are powerless. But that, that's a, I mean, anyone who's done a psychedelic knows that. <laughs> you don't, you don't have to, you know, that's a, you don't have to do that. So I, I think it's great, but also um, I, I think the 12 steps are wonderful. I think doing the steps are, is a great practice, but again, it's the, the environment could be changed a lot and it's always been my approach to people because I've worked with a lot of people who did not like the 12 steps. A lot of the people that came to me to get over addiction had tried 12 step models and failed over and over and over and we just were not getting success. And I think, you know, if you're looking for a community, you're looking for a group of people, maybe you should be here. Maybe you should be at a yoga class or a book club, or developing an interest outside of drug use. Like, why does that have to be the shared interest? So I think there's a huge, there, there needs to be a huge shift within that culture and for people that are struggling with addiction within this country. Because it, it doesn't help to think of yourself like that. I don't think it helps anyone. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you work with people who are trying to get off pharmaceutical drugs, like antidepressants? Like antidepressants? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so my, my work primarily was with addictive substances like cocaine, methamphetamine, and opiates. That was primarily what I worked with. But a lot of the people would come in with co-occurring addictions to SSRIs, benzodiazepines was very common, or uh, Ritalin type substances, amphetamine type substances. So I did work with them a lot. And the, be you know, the beautiful thing that, that a lot of people don't realize is that there are psychedelics you can use when you're on those substances. You know, they may not be as strong and you may not get the, the full effect, but they're not dangerous. There are some that you shouldn't do. Right? Ayahuasca being one, uh, ibogaine is not something you want to do with certain certain pharmaceuticals, uh, but that require those often require tapering as well. You know you have to be careful because some of the withdrawal symptoms can cause pretty severe, uh, pretty pretty tough, pretty tough situations for people, and and can people can even die from some of the withdrawal symptoms with some of the pharmaceutical medications. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's ultimately it's no different, you know, I mean, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question, but I wanted to say, I um, was in a foster program starting at 19 and I'm 42. Like it worked, the 12 steps work to let go of a lot of stuff, um, deal with resentments, kind of clean out my past, but um, the culture of if you relapse, 
you're not willing. Like you're not willing. Yeah. Sponsors firing, new sponsor. Um, like there's something wrong with me that I can't get this. And I, you know, graduated uh, out of that program into psychedelics. And um, yeah, much better. Yeah. Great to meet you. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you with the statistics you saw uh, working with the people in the house in San Diego, if you think now that Ibogaine is a essential part of someone on the three drugs you mentioned, detoxing before they can do the work? Or if you think this other work that you're doing is enough in and of itself? So I believe psychedelics are the key. I, I think all this other stuff that, that I talked about and the, the, the integration pieces and everything you can do with your life are important, but I, I am a, I'm a firm believer that there needs to be a catalyst, right? We're talking, if anyone knows chemistry, we're talking with like a pretty difficult reaction here to happen of like changing addiction into something much healthier. And so you need catalysts. And so I do believe psychedelics are a key piece of that. And for me, in, in my belief, in my, what I advocate is that, yeah, psychedelics, I actually, it's step zero. It's like, start, start there. Start using psychedelics in a, in a healthy way. You'll, you, will, you will gain something. And it may take time. It may not be all at once. I mean, I remember I cooked ayahuasca on my stove to try to get over heroin addiction the first time. Did it work? Nope. <laughs> nope. I tried a lot of psychedelics. Did they work? Nope. But they were part of the path. They were part of the process of me getting to where I needed to be. So I'm a I'm 100% advocate of psychedelics being a part of recovery. And, you know, everything else just works in tandem. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I would say, and I, and I wouldn't say it necessarily has to be a specific psychedelic either. I get asked a lot. People ask me all the time, oh, hey, you know, should I do, should I do Ibogaine for this? Or should I do this for this? Or this for this? And a lot of people have this idea that it's going to be this one thing that's going to mm -hmm. win the battle and they're going to be fine. Oh, yeah. Well, for me, I think it was just the last thing. I had no other options. If that didn't work, I was screwed. You know, like, it could have been anything, probably, at that moment. Because I was in such a place that I, I was done. So it's just, it's about giving yourself the allowance to try and not getting, and whenever you, whenever you don't succeed, not, you know, oh, no, I got to start counting again. No, it's all part of the process. It's all part of the evolution of being. So yeah, that was more what I meant. This was yeah. I yeah. Because I know so yeah. little about it. Thank yeah. you. So I think I mean it's great for opiates because it takes care of withdrawal symptoms. Everything else, you give it, give a lot of stuff. I mean, I've heard so many experiences where people have taken mushrooms or taken LSD or this, that, and the other, and their addiction was lifted, or they were ready for the addiction to let go. So, yeah. Is this psychedelics you're including ibogaine? And I'm, I'm wondering too, when you said the other stuff, so what are the other components? You said psychedelics, what are the other components of, of the treatment program? Yeah, so, yeah, ibogaine would be one of the psychedelics, for sure. And, and I'm, I use a pretty loose definition with psychedelics. I mean, I, I could even include cannabis and MDMA, um, even though they're not technically, classically psychedelics, but just generally non-ordinary states of consciousness. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, we think of psychedelics as substances, but, you know, psychedelic is mind manifesting. So breath work, yoga, like these are also psychedelics. Dreaming was the first psychedelic, mm -hmm. right? Like psychedelic is just us getting out of our mind. And, and if we can do that intentionally, that's the ticket. That's the key. That's the the access that we have, right? If, even if it's a sweat lodge or dancing around a fire or chanting, these things have powerful impact on people and their health and well-being and their spiritual uh, growth. So 
all of these things, right? And then, like I was saying, all the little things too. Like not looking at Facebook at 10.59 when you got to go to sleep at 11. Or waking up and checking your text messages. Or, uh, you know, whatever you're eating, it being garbage. Or eating once a day. Or drinking water, tap water. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things and I can get pretty specific with all that stuff. But I don't want to. Because that's like that's advanced practitioner type type of stuff like when we're talking about addiction and and really being an addiction you start with the easiest stuff first so does that does that make sense yeah. okay yeah questions more yeah your thoughts on um problematic psychedelic use um let's just say through a lens of light spiritual bypass, avoidance, um, negative consequences as a result of psychedelic use, because I agree psychedelics are extremely powerful and create uh, tons of change and can yeah. be a very powerful catalyst, but um, can also be problematic for certain people, and um, particularly people that are constantly using any substance at all. So, I mean, what are your thoughts just on problematic psychedelic use? Yeah, it's a good question because psychedelic use in conjunction with addiction and some of these addictive substances can be difficult experiences. I've witnessed people having really challenging episodes as they use psychedelics while also in the midst of serious addictions. So this is, this is one of the tough components and this is where education plays a huge role and intentionality plays a huge role um you know i that that would be my answer to that is that to use psychedelics in the midst of addiction there just there has to be some understanding and well-guided effort into it and i wouldn't advise anyone who is approaching to use psychedelics to do so in a in a naive way or in a haphazard way or even in a way of like hoping it's all they're gonna it's gonna save their life i don't think that's a healthy attitude either because that's where people get let down hard you know it's it's more about just simple stuff about having an experience and and taking in the small things the challenge is, is getting people to do that on psychedelics when they're in an altered state is difficult. And I think that's why it's important that there are more and more guides. There are more, there's more and more support around this idea. And even if it's microdosing, starting there. But you got to think, when people are using addictive substances, they are, they're putting themselves in tough spots consistently, right? They're going through various psychoses. They are... Uh, doing damaging things to themselves and to their environment, to their family, to their friends, to their social world already. And you know, some eggs are going to get broken. They're already they're already getting smashed. And I don't see the current the current pathway solving any problems really of just sending people to treatment centers. And so I, I, I'm okay with taking a radical stance and saying that they, people need to do this because the other stuff's not working, you know? And then just outside of addiction, the idea of spiritual bypass and seeing that with just your average person yeah. not struggling with a substance per se, Yeah. but um, using substances like psychedelics to escape responsibility, uh -huh. such as, you know, leaving the country because they don't want to get a job instead of chasing medicine stories. And, you know, I, I know certain people currently do this <laughs> and they're not finding, the only answer they keep discovering is that they need to go back and get a job. Yeah. <laughs> right. and, um, and that's after, you know, 10, for 20 Peruvian adventures, it's the, the struggle to yeah. accept, ah, oh, damn, I have to go and work and make money. I hate that. Yeah. You know? So I, I, that's, I guess, I've just seen a parallel. Yeah, so that. I, I think that's a great question, is what, what to do with people that are 
using psychedelics and spiritual bypass. And I, I personally, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder when people just use the term medicine like as this overarching thing of all psychedelic experiences. I really don't agree. I think there's, there's a lot of people using these substances in the right way. There's a lot of the people using these substances to have a good time. And, you know, they, there was a really good term that I heard recently, which was unsupervised substance, or what was it? Unsupervised self-exploration, right? That was a really, and it's U-S-E, use. Um, I think Annie Oak said that, but unsupervised self-exploration whether we call it spiritual bypass from our perspective or whether that's actually their spiritual process is just a matter of perspective. You know, who am I to say that this person is spiritually bypassing just because I disagree with their process? I, I recently finished um, Siddhartha and it was a wonderful book. Anyone who hasn't read it, read it. If you want to read a really great book, easy book. But it basically is about a young man who meets the Buddha and says, ah, I don't think so, and goes and does like, you know, ha, you know, goes and meets a courtesan and has all kinds of sex and pleasure and makes a bunch of money and then comes back and it all comes full circle, right? So with our narrow view of what's happening to that person who's done those 20 Peru trips and they're figuring out, oh, I need to work, I need to work, well, what happens when they finally work and they say, oh, I figured it out. It was a spiritual bypass or was that just this process that they had to go through, you know? So we just have to let go of our judgment of their thing and let go of our attachment to where they need to be, right? That's, I think, the because that's our own addiction is trying to get everyone to do what we want them to do. <laughs> I suffer from that one a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have an addict in my family. And, uh, someone with an addiction? Yeah, someone with an addiction. Good. You got it. You got me. Uh, where was I going with this? You sidetracked every time. Sorry, you have someone in your family with an yeah, addiction. It's an addiction. And the way you describe it is this addiction is alcohol. And alcohol is his medicine to numb the terrible feelings that he has when he's not using alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it sounds like there's deep trauma of some kind mm -hmm. beyond my capability to understand. So do you think psychedelics can address those traumas directly? In particular, like I hear that claim a lot for ayahuasca. Oh, I took ayahuasca and it was like 20 years of therapy and I'm all better now. And I've heard that in this room many times. Mm -hmm. And I don't happen to agree with that. What is your thoughts about that? Well, it can be that way, for sure. That, that's a possibility. So the question was, in case anyone didn't hear, is with someone who has an addiction, specifically an addiction to alcohol, and the alcohol is their self-described medicine to help them deal with the pain, and the, the bad thoughts that they have, it, are psychedelics uh, a good outlet for them? And would it just be doing an ayahuasca ceremony be the ticket, you know, the 20 years of therapy in one, in one night kind of idea? It can be that way, for sure. That does happen for some people. But I think that gets overblown a little bit because I think it happens less for more people than it actually happens to. Mm -hmm. But ayahuasca can be a really valuable tool for that person to start the self-exploration process. Just like therapy can be a valuable tool, just like the 12 steps can be a valuable tool for them to start to uncover. You know, I don't know, which, which step is it? Step four, or where you're writing everything down and, mm -hmm. right, step four. So you're writing everything down, all the things you've done wrong, you're, you're basically journaling and so these are all processes into that. The beautiful thing about a psychedelic is, is that if you can collaborate with it and, and have this same kind of intentionality of diving in and you have the right support, I want to make that really important, is that you have the right 
practitioners or guides, or if you want to call them shamans, there to help you in that process, then yeah, absolutely, it can be a super valuable experience, but it may not be one and done. It may take time to uncover the layers and the layers of what's going on. But I do think, yeah, it's, it's beneficial. Yeah, this particular person went to Peru for two weeks and drank a lot of medicine and did plant diets and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was totally ineffective. He mm -hmm. was drunk within the day of coming back to LA. Yeah, I've, I've seen it many times, many times. Again, it's, it's not about quitting. That's the thing is he thought he would go to Peru, drink ayahuasca, and be cured. That's the fundamental ish. That's the fundamental misconception. Mm -hmm. Is that the psychedelics are not a cure all? They're not a quick fix. They are another tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And anyone who approaches it like, oh, I'm going to do this and it's going to fix my life, you got another thing coming. You got another thing coming because, yeah, it may it may uncover stuff, but it may get worse. There's, there's this thing about within the context of spiritual emergency, if any of you are familiar with that term. And it's when you, you have a crisis a being, a crisis that causes you to become dysfunctional, right? Which I think that's what addiction is, is this crisis of, of recognition of who you are. So you become dysfunctional. Well, even when you emerge out from that, there are still times where you will hit troughs. There are still moments where you will go back in and you will feel terrible. And this is, this is well documented amongst the people that study this process and study this kind of experience is that it's not just smooth sailing. Like, you know, if anyone expected life to be that way, then <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to tell you because it is not that way for anyone, I don't think. Unless you're the Buddha, but I've... so my advocate just keep keep working on it, keep working on it. Pick up practices, pick up simple things, right? Don't quit. Keep working. If I'd quit when I tried ayahuasca the first time, or when I tried anything the first time, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have made it. And I, even after I did Ibogaine, I had a lot of issues. I had a lot of stuff I still had to work through. That if I had quit using, if I had quit, if I had quit working, I would have ended up using heroin again for sure. So you got to keep on it. It's, it's a journey. Yeah. 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 Short answer. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as um, do you have any knowledge or experience of um, people working through um, deep trauma or like PTSD issues, the kinds of things that lead to addictive behaviors? Or often, you know, um, cross training in addictions, if you will, mm -hmm. um, to avoid any uh, pure addiction. But also, does, have you had any experience with that helping with those kinds of things? Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is something that Gabor Mate talks a lot about, which is a lot of people with addictions have experienced some sort of pretty serious trauma in their early life or at some point in their life. And I, I've seen that as well, but most of my work was actually in people that were, had fairly regular lives, you know, were white middle class from suburbia who ended up getting into drugs. Um, the people with trauma, I have seen it, I've read about it, I've encountered it, and ultimately it's not that much different. I would say that those people usually, those people usually, when they do figure it out, they really figure it out. So, I don't, you know, yes, to answer the question. I could have just said yes, huh? <laughs> I had to uh, see. I, I like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks so much, Charles. Yeah. Thank, thank you much. all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I loved how you uh, 
specifically talked about integration as being a way to kind of frame your day from starting in the morning and in the evening. And you know, when you think about it, every day is really a ceremony. So we open the day with the blessing for the day and an intention for the ceremony. We conclude the ceremony in the evening by sealing the energy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that strategy. Yeah, and who knows what goes on in the ceremony? You know, <laughs> it could <Exactly>. be wild. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, how can people get in touch with you afterwards? And do you want to sh uh, share a little bit about your book? Do you have that available today? Yeah, for sure. So, the book is called Facets of Ayahuasca. And basically, I wrote this because in doing work with ayahuasca and working with a lot of people, I encountered a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same stuff kept coming up. And so, Dario here, my friend, said, hey, why don't we write a book? And I'm one of those people that if someone says, hey, why don't we do something? I say, sure, you know, <laughs> I don't really think about the consequences. And so uh, we went for it and we wrote a book. And uh, basically, we wanted to provide a guide, simple, to help explain some of the things that happen within the experience, some of the things you can do before to prepare and what you can do after to integrate. And it covers a lot of topics. It's definitely not comprehensive. And it's not gonna tell you, uh, we didn't really focus so much on like science necessarily. We didn't focus on research necessarily. It's mainly from a perspective of what you would experience if you were to do ayahuasca here, possibly in the States. And just to help you in that process, because there's a lot more people that are experiencing ayahuasca here in the United States um, in these kind of contexts, right? Not going to Peru. And so they have to go back to work the next day. And what does that look like? And what are the, some of the, how do they deal with some of these issues that are coming up in ceremony if they can't talk to a facilitator or go to a group or, you know, talk to someone? So that's why we wrote the book. And uh, we have some copies here. How much are they, Dario? Uh, I think on <laughs> Amazon, there, I actually, it might be on the back of the book. Um, on Amazon, they're $14.95. But, you know, that's as a publisher, that's like a pricing strategy. So I think we can do like something more complimentary. Just say what it is. Here. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> just just give it a yeah, there, There's something that, that does that's annoys me to no end when there's like an extra dollar or two. So I think just $10 tonight. $10. Oh, All right. Like nice. Oh, I bought mine for 15 off of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you have a friend that might want to <laughs> so yeah, if you'd like to, if you'd like to purchase some books, I'm gonna leave that to Dario. I'll be happy to sign, but uh, my signature is really simple. So. <laughs> Perfect. So we'll take a few minutes um, once we're done to do that. Part. Yeah, and and to get in touch with me, um, that's a great question. I I don't do a lot on social media. I am on Facebook, so you can reach out there. Uh, I'm not a Twitter, Instagram guy yet. I'm still kind of figuring out if I want to do that. And then uh, you can always, I do, I don't. I want to get someone to do it for me. That's what I yes. want to happen, you know. But uh, also my, my email, you can always get my email. I wish I had a whiteboard. I love whiteboards, by the way. Whiteboard, that's a great integration tool. Put a whiteboard up. <laughs> You know, sticky ones, start writing stuff down, start seeing things every day, you know. You can do this on your bathroom mirror, by bathroom the way. Bathroom mirror, yeah. With whiteboard markers. Simple stuff. That's vision board. Pictures of your heroes. I mean, come on, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So. I, I wanted to mention there are also, there are four authors total. So yeah, so there's, there's I co-authored this, yeah. yeah. So and with Dario. Very different. Uh, experiences and background like winter she worked in Peru for over a year mm -hmm. you know, facilitating people and all of that so that was um, very diverse and I also interviewed other people as well so we really tried to get like a wide variety of perspectives and but it was so interesting how when we talk to people and even as we're writing be like, well, I've never had this experience before. And you, like, how many ceremonies have you done? You're like, well, I've never had this experience before. You know? So I thought that was really cool just to, like, hear people's experiences. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that gets talked about. A lot <laughs> we of know stuff. It. That's a lot of stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of fun to co-author a book with people. It's, 
It's good. It's a good. It's a good. It's a good experience of learning, of letting go. Yeah. Surrender. It's a great learning. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Yeah, for sure.